The BJP has finally published its manifesto for the 2024 Lok Sabha elections nearly a week after the Congress released its manifesto and we can now finally play Manifesto Wars. We have in fact devoted a whole episode of The Bond Economist on the economic impact of the Congress manifesto. I'll leave a link in the description. Basically in a nutshell, it was like the Congress becoming the Terminator, firing freebies at anyone and everyone in the crowd. Be it 1 lakh rupees uh, to every poor family or 1 lakh rupees to every college pass out becoming apprentices or waving off over 1 lakh crore rupees worth of student loans, the Congress manifesto had gone all out. In fact, a few days after the manifesto came out, Rahul Gandhi announced in a campaign speech that he also intends to waive off farmer loans. This, by the way, wasn't on the manifesto, but I guess Mr. Gandhi was like, uh, Itna jab order kari hai hai, to ye bhi bil mein dal do. And we calculated in the previous video that the fiscal deficit, which is the gap between the government spending versus the government revenues, under the pressure of all these Congress promises, could possibly balloon to ridiculously high levels and that could have a disastrous impact on the economy. So in the manifesto wars, did the BJP outrun the Congress in this populism race or did it choose a different race altogether? Hello and welcome to The Bond Economist, your one-stop destination for professional advice on the economy. My name is Arudeep Nandi and today we pit the BJP manifesto against the Congress manifesto. Which of the two has a better vision for India? What's said, what's unsaid, and what that means for the economy? Look, at some level, you've got to empathize with Congress's situation. They haven't been in power for 10 years. The BJP has. So the BJP can afford to say in their manifesto that, hey, we have been doing A, B, C, D, E programs, and we think that these are all resounding successes. So in our manifesto, we are committing to simply expand these programs. Control C, Control V. The Congress doesn't have this luxury. It can't say in the manifesto that we would like to expand the scope of a PM Kisan or a PM Awas Yojana or a Mudra scheme because doing so would indirectly be admitting that the government schemes are doing great. They could have, of course, suggested to the nation a different working model of how to uh, generate affordable housing or build infrastructure or ensure financial inclusion. But then that needs a lot of planning and expertise for which no one has the time uh, during elections. So what's the next best thing that they could do to grab voter attention? Well, offer a lot of freebies, a lakh rupee here, a lakh rupee there. You don't need to tell the public where you're going to get the money from. The other angle is also that the BJP seriously sees itself coming back to power. Every opinion poll coming out seems to suggest that they will most likely get another year of absolute majority. So unlike the Congress, who are probably not worried right now about the practicality of their promises, the BJP has to be very careful that they don't end up promising something that they might regret implementing two months later after they're elected to power. So the Congress can say things like, I will jump from the 20th floor of a building and land on my feet. But for the BJP to match that boast, they would actually have to think about the zip line, the pulleys, the harness, the whatnot, because there's a high chance that they may actually be required to jump. And so I think the most important part of BJP's manifesto was actually hidden somewhere in the middle. There's a line where they say that, the BJP is committed to sustaining financial macro stability, that is high growth while maintaining low inflation and fiscal prudence, which is code for saying that, look, we don't intend to spend irresponsibly just to generate growth and in the process risk higher inflation and invite other macro problems, which then also means that you're left with a boring manifesto. One where you end up saying we will expand the scope of our existing programs and no other fireworks. Meanwhile, the Congress doesn't talk about macro stability at all in its manifesto. So it is busy lighting so many fireworks that there is a risk of an actual fire. And so as we drill down to the details of what is being offered to different segments of the economy, you'll find that this is the fundamental difference between the BJP's offer and the Congress's offer. Let's start with poverty reduction and women welfare. 
the BJP is all about expanding or continuing with existing programs. Um, it is said that it will expand the PM Awas Yojana, which is the affordable housing scheme, PM uh, Ujwala Yojana, which is about giving LPG connections, and they also want to expand the piped gas uh, program, uh, expanding the PM Swanidhi program, which is about giving micro credit to street vendors. Uh, expanding their flagship Lakpati uh, Didi scheme, which is a skill development program for women through self-help groups to enable them to earn 1 lakh rupees annually. Um, expand the Swach Bharat program to build more toilets. Uh, Ayushman Bharat scheme of health insurance to now cover senior citizens and transgender individuals. And of course, continuing with the free food scheme for over 80 crore Indians. By the way, the last item might sound like a populist thing, but it actually isn't. Uh, we had in fact covered this in detail in another episode of The Bond Economist. I'll also leave a link of that uh, in the description. So before the pandemic, Indians were entitled to 5 kg of food grains at really subsidized prices, like a few rupees per kg. During and then after the pandemic, the government was not only selling this 5 kg as usual, but in addition was also giving 5 kg extra for free. So we would get 10 kgs of food grains, of which 5 kg was ultra subsidized and 5 kg was free. Now the problem for the government was that this was getting too expensive. Also, we were literally running out of wheat. So what the government did was to very cleverly say, look, that 1 rupee, 2 rupee, 3 rupee that we were charging per kilo of food grains, we are making it free now. So it got marketed as a free food scheme. The catch being that the amount was reduced back to 5 kgs from 10 kgs. So actually, despite the branding of free food, the fiscal burden on the government actually came down because instead of procuring 10 kg of food grains per citizen, the government now only has to procure 5 kgs. Another new thing on the block is something that the finance minister uh, announced in the interim budget, which is the solar rooftop scheme, a subsidy to set up uh, solar rooftops with the aim of providing a certain amount of free electricity to households. Now, this has been the BJP's broad offer. What has the Congress offered? Well, the sun, moon and stars. One lakh to the oldest woman in every poor family, which as we had flagged earlier, depending on how you define the poverty line, could cost you anywhere between 0.2 to 0.9% of GDP, if not more. Urban Employment Guarantee Scheme, where studies show that it can cost anywhere between 1.7 to 2.7% of GDP. By the way, for reference, our fiscal deficit for FI25 is 5.1% of GDP. That's the target. So shelling out 2 or 3% of GDP just on freebies and programs is no joke. The Congress has also talked of increasing government pensions, increasing uh, travel concessions for senior citizens, and also increasing the national minimum wage to 400 rupees per day. Incidentally, while the BJP manifesto hasn't committed to any value they have also mentioned that they will do a periodic review of the national floor wages, suggesting that minimum wages seems to be a hot political topic. Next, let's consider the other major voting bloc, India's youth. If you list out what the Congress is promising, the offer looks much more meaty. 1 lakh for college passouts who are signing up to be apprentices, uh, filling up 30 lakh uh, vacancies in the central government, Abolishing the Agnipat scheme for armed forces, where most recruits will now only have a four-year term, which will help the government reduce its large pension bill. Congress also wants to waive off all education loans, which is over 1 lakh crore rupees or anywhere between 03 to 0.4% of GDP. Add to that their offer of collateral free loans for disadvantaged groups and a new employment-linked incentive scheme for corporates who get tax credits against additional hiring for regular jobs. In contrast, the major highlight on the BJP side has only been doubling the mudra loan limit. This is cheap loans for micro enterprises. They've doubled it from 10 lakhs to 20 lakh rupees. Other stuff on the manifesto are actually quite generic, like uh, expanding the Startup India program, committing to more IITs, IIMs, AIMS, uh, uh, having one nation, one student ID card, legislation to prevent paper leaks. By the way, this also seems to be a hot political topic because even Congress mentioned in their manifesto that they want to fast track court cases on leaked question papers. 
What about farmers? Again, same theme. The BJP manifesto talks about expanding current programs like committing to PM Kisan for the next five years that gives 6,000 rupees annually to farmers, uh, expanding the crop insurance program, developing supply chain infrastructure, facilitating animal husbandry. And if you look at the Congress manifesto, apart from this PM Kisan scheme, actually most of these other proposals are also there in different language. Where Congress differs is that it is committing to buy crops at MSP calculated by the Swaminathan Commission. And I explained this in detail in my previous video on the Congress manifesto. Please have a look at it. Uh, basically, MSP is set at at least 50% of the cost of farmers production. The Congress's preferred formula would lead to a higher cost base. So the MSP would also increase, which would of course be great for farmers, but a major hit to the government's food subsidy bill, which is already elevated at around 2 lakh crore rupees or 0.6% of GDP, and also a risk of higher food inflation for consumers like you and me. And if we add to this Rahul Gandhi's farm loan waiver announcement that he just casually mentioned later, well, you know, for the sake of my own sanity, I have stopped counting the costs at this point. On infrastructure, again, both BJP and Congress largely seem to offer the same things. We will build more roads, railways, airports, metros. But somehow BJP's promises look more feasible for two reasons. One, they have actually done quite a lot. You can see better highways, you can see metros come up, um, you can see refurbished airports, uh, Vande Bharat trains, uh, a bullet train that is coming up. So when the manifesto says that, hey, we will get bullet trains also in the north, south and east, you know that it's not an empty promise, that there's actually a decent track record of the government in the last 10 years delivering on these projects. But the second reason is that the government has also created the fiscal space to spend on infrastructure. The government is spending near record levels of budget resources on infrastructure at 3.4% of GDP this year. These are levels that we haven't seen in a very, very long time. And they are able to budget this despite bringing down fiscal deficit from over 9% of GDP during the pandemic to around 5% of GDP plan this year. How have they managed to do this? Well, one, they've gotten higher uh, tax collections, but two, more importantly, they've also cut down on subsidies, on regular spending items, what is also known as revenue expenditure. To give you a sense of this, revenue expenditure was nearly 13% of GDP in FY23. Now it's planned at 11% of GDP. Meanwhile, capital spending was 2.7% of GDP then, now it's 3.4% of GDP. So the government has literally been saving up space in its budget to spend more on infrastructure. But can the Congress do that? Well, not really. All these cash handouts, loan waivers and whatnot will eventually cause revenue expenditure to shoot up. And as a result, fiscal deficit and by extension, national debt will balloon up. So where will you then have the money to spend on infrastructure projects? So look, at one level, yes, you could argue that the BJP manifesto is boring. They haven't announced anything radical, rather it's a continuation of existing schemes. My personal suspicion though is that there might be a lot of things left unsaid in this manifesto. Look, I don't really think that the next five years are indeed going to be so boring. Because if Prime Minister Modi is serious about getting India to become a $5 trillion or $7 trillion economy, India will have to undertake serious next-gen reforms. For instance, you can't build large infrastructure projects if your land acquisition laws are archaic. You can't expect companies to thrive and invest in India if the labor laws are too complicated and difficult to comply with. You can't have world-class agriculture if your farm laws date back to socialist days um, that preserves the monopolies of middlemen and doesn't allow private sector to participate. And so these reforms will need to take place. And when they do, they will inevitably hurt some sections of the society, those who have benefited from existing inefficiencies. And these sections are likely to vehemently oppose any disruption to this old order. 
The government has already faced this when it tried to undertake farm reforms and actually before that land reforms. So my sense is that if the BJP comes to power, they will try to get some of these politically difficult reforms done. But to implement these reforms, especially in a country like India, you need to have a lot of political tact. You need to do your homework. You need to engage with the right stakeholders. I mean, some of the most difficult reforms in India have actually happened without much noise. You need to have the right strategy. A clumsy way to go about it is to announce them loudly in an election manifesto because that will paint a huge target on the back of those reforms. And as was the case with the first round of farm uh, protests, good economics may have to then die at the altar of bad politics. Look, ultimately all of this boils down to what kind of economic philosophy uh, you prefer. The BJP's mantra has broadly been that let's keep macro fundamentals, that's growth, inflation, fiscal deficit, national debt, uh, current account deficit, banking sector health uh, stable. Let's simplify rules and regulations. Let's make it easier to do business. Let's invest in good infrastructure. In short, let's create the right macro and the right business environment for companies to invest and then they will come and invest. They will bring new technologies. They will generate jobs, generate exports and generate wealth. And that in turn should eventually lead to higher consumption. Now, the Congress economic model is one where the focus is on consumption rather than anything else. So in their model, the government plays a predominant role, runs large welfare programs, offers loan waivers, tries to preserve the existing system as much as it can, a very leftist utopia. And so there could always be higher consumption and possibly lesser poverty when the government rolls out these schemes. But eventually the economic engine could start sputtering. Because if the fiscal car skids out of control, then we could get a repeat of UPA 2's term, where we had high fiscal deficit, high inflation, high current account deficit, uneven growth and weak macro confidence in India to the extent that we were almost on the verge of being downgraded by global rating agencies to junk status at that point. Also remember that when a government overspends, when there is no need to, it ends up racking huge debts. Debts that come to bite it when tomorrow an actual shock hits the economy, like say a war somewhere or oil prices shooting up or say another health crisis like the pandemic happening. At that time, when the economy is truly in crisis, the government will struggle to find the fiscal space to support its citizens because it already has so much debt on its books that it needs to service. And so the economic downturn from the shock will actually deepen further because the government isn't available to rescue the economy. And you've seen versions of this model in our neighborhood in Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and closer home the fiscal crisis in states like Karnataka and Telangana, where the state exchequer is struggling under the weight of poll promises. So the next time when any political party offers you something for free, ask yourself, how much does free cost? For more such insights, like, share and subscribe to The Bond Economist.